pray. Father, how great it is to know that you care for us. You care for me. You care about every person in this room so much that you sent your son to die for us. And you invite us to come as we are now in prayer with any problem that we may have or encounter in life. We can cast it upon you and you always listen every time and you will help us by the power of your mighty hand to do the things that we could never do on our own and to make it through situations in life that we could never make it through without your help. You enable us to accomplish things that we could never have accomplished on your own. Oh, Father, I pray that you would use Peter's words to deflate any sense of superiority or pride or elevated sense of self-worth that might be welling up in our hearts today. Rid us of those desires, I pray, and help us to be humble as your servant Jesus was humble. And it's in his precious and holy name that I pray. Amen. In 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter begins in verses 1 through 4 by addressing the elders and telling them not to shepherd the flock in a in a self-exalting way, in a domineering way, or a way for selfish and greedy gain, but instead to do it humbly, in a God-honoring way, not under compulsion, not for shameful gain or domineering, but in a way God would have you. And then in verse 5, at the beginning of the verse, he turns his attention to those who are younger, and he says, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. So put yourself in the proper place with respect to the authorities in the church. Don't exalt yourself above them. Recognize your place right there under their authority. And finally, in the passage that we're going to focus on today, Peter broadens the scope He broadens the scope to all of you. Look at verse five. He says, all of you clothe yourselves with humility. The elders, the young men, the women, all of you, no one can miss this. Humility is a central make it or break it issue in the life of the believer. And if you lack this essential attitude of humility, then everything that you do for the kingdom will be tainted with a self-serving, self-advancing, self-exalting disposition that will derail your pursuit of godliness into a pursuit of selfishness. What we need is a mindset that recognizes our total dependence on God, that we need Him. And because of that dependence on God, we cannot think too highly of ourselves because anything good that's produced in us is a product of Him. We owe it to him, our gratitude for that. It's not not me, it's God. So Peter exhorts all of us in verses five, six, and seven. And here's what I think his main point is. I think his main point is clothe yourselves, all of you, with a mindset of humility that says, God, I need you. That's Peter's main point, clothe yourselves with a mindset of humility that says, God, I need you. And we're going to look at how he develops that point, that message in four parts. This is where we're going. The first, the reason to be humble. Why would we want to live this way? In verse five. Second, the motivation to be humble. What drives, our moti- what motivates us to live humbly? That's in verse six. Third, the way to be humble. How do we live humbly? In verse seven, the first part of verse seven, and then at the very end of verse seven, Peter's going to remind us of the amazing love and care of God for the humble. So the reason to be humble, the motivation to be humble, the way to be humble, and the care of God for the humble. That's where we're going, so why are we here? Why did I choose to talk about pride and humility from 1 Peter today. And there's two reasons that I chose this text. And the first is because I personally have been deeply convicted time and time again of my need to confess and repent of pride. And this text has helped with that. And my hunch is that I'm not alone. 
My hunch is that as I look around right now, there are many others who can relate and who know exactly what I'm talking about. And so Peter's words are here to, to be of help. And the second reason is because this issue of pride, this issue will destroy your ministry. If you wanna be useful to God in ministry, you can't be his opposition by being prideful. So if you wanna be a tool, an instrument that God can use in a positive way to advance his kingdom and his gospel, you can't do that by harboring an attitude of pride. The pride has to go. And so those are the two reasons that I chose this text, but probably more important than why I came here, why did Peter put this in his letter? We're at the very end of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter five, and really the last paragraph of the book. Why does Peter end his letter warning against pride and exhorting us to be humble? And I think that the answer is that in this letter, Peter was exhorting believers to live radically God-centered lives. Think for a moment about some of the things that Peter says in this book. Think about chapter two, verse 19, where Peter says, for this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Enduring sorrows while suffering unjustly and calling that gracious, that's radical. That's a radical way to live and view life. Or look at what Peter tells the wives at the end of chapter three and verse six. He says, do not fear anything that is frightening. Do not fear anything that is frightening. I thought it's frightening because you're supposed to fear it. And Peter says, don't fear anything that is frightening. This is radical stuff. Or Look at just a few verses down, chapter three and verse nine. Peter says, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. So Peter says, if you've got somebody who's reviling you or somebody who's slandering you or somebody who's performing acts of evil against you, bless them. Now how counterintuitive or countercultural does that seem? This is a radically God-centered way to live that Peter is calling us to. And finally, chapter four, verse 13, Peter says, rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. Rejoice in suffering. All of this, counting suffering as gracious, not fearing anything that is frightening, blessing those who hurt you, rejoicing through suffering, all of that is a radically God-centered way to live. And I think that Peter ends this letter by warning us against pride and exhorting us to live humbly because he knows that it's impossible to live the way he's described in this book if you're harboring an attitude of pride. It's not possible, it's a contradiction. When you think of someone who's prideful, do you think of someone who doesn't retaliate? When you think of someone who's prideful, do you think of someone who turns the other cheek rather rather than striking back? Or do you think of someone who accepts suffering when it comes and trusts God? Or when you think of someone prideful, do you think of someone who says to God, how dare you make me suffer like this? I don't deserve this. I'm better than this suffering. It's not possible to live the way Peter's describing throughout this letter if you maintain an attitude of pride. So if you wanna live like Peter says to live, we've got to listen carefully to what he says in chapter five, verses five through seven about pride. So look together with me. First Peter chapter five, verse five. It says, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility. Now, at this point, we can't really go on talking about humility unless we know exactly what Peter meant when he used the word. And I think that the best place to start, if we wanna know what Peter meant by the word humility, is to see what he says that it is not. Look with me at the end of verse five. Peter says, God opposes the proud, 
but gives grace to the humble. Do you see what Peter did there? He's staging humility as the opposite of pride. They're opposites in Peter's view. So what is humility then? Well, Peter says it's the opposite of pride. So if pride is a self-exalting attitude, then humility must be an attitude of lowliness. I think that Peter both confirms and clarifies this in the next verse. Look with me at verse six. He says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God. Peter's image of humility is that of someone under God's mighty hand. That is someone who's got such a meek and lowly view of self, but not only that, who they've exalted God. So a meek and lowly view of self and an exalted view of God. That's what humility is, because when you recognize your place under God's mighty hand, just like the younger ones recognize their place under the authority of the elders, and the elders recognize their place, not doing ministry for shameful gain, but under the authority of God. When you recognize your place right there under God's hand, and you're not trying to exalt yourself in pride above God, then you're, in turn, elevating your view of God. So if, if pride, if humility is the opposite of pride, and if humility is this, according to Peter, a humble, lowly view of yourself coupled with this exalted view of God, then I think it's reasonable to infer that pride, being the opposite of that, is an exalted view of self and a low view of God. Do you see how bad the pride is as it changes the way we relate to God? Thus, the prideful person not seeking a place under the hand of God, but rather in his pride, exalting himself above God. This is, this is the definitions of, of pride and humility that I think is the most clearest way to say this. I think that humility is an attitude that constantly says, God, I need you, while pride is an attitude that says, I've got this. The implication is that the prideful person has less of a need for God. And I know what you might be tempted to think there. You might be tempted to say, well, I struggle with pride from time to time, but I would never make a claim like that. I would never say that I don't need God. But I want you to think just a little bit more carefully. Because when you say when you fail to attribute your gifts or your accomplishments or anything good that you might acquire in this life, when you fail to attribute those to God and when you instead begin to focus on what you have done or what you are capable of or what you are good at, whenever your focus turns on things that elevate you and away from God, you're failing to recognize just how dependent on God you really are. You've become exalted in heart and you've forgotten the Lord your God and that communicates to God, I've got this and I don't need you. Oh, thank God that we have Peter here to knock down that kind of prideful, God-reducing thinking. So when Peter says to clothe yourselves with humility in verse five, He's saying to put on an attitude that is constantly recognizing your dependence on God. When you wake up in the morning, clothe yourselves with that. Let people see that when you go about your business from day to day. And this brings us to our first point. What is the reason to be humble? Why would we want to live this way? After all, humility is not considered a virtue in our culture. Who do you know who wins a political campaign in America by being humble? Instead, culture sees those who do much boasting as powerful, while those who appear humble, they come across as weak. So why would you want to live like that? And you do it because of the end of verse five. Look with me. Peter says, for, there's the reason, 
For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humility and pride function like a dimmer switch on a lamp. When you turn the switch, the light begins to fade and it's immediately replaced by the darkness. So with humility and pride, when you turn the switch, the humility begins to fade away and it's immediately replaced with pride. You, it's impossible to be neither prideful nor humble. Your attitude is going to incline one way or the other. And the reason that Peter says that we want our attitudes to incline towards humility and away from pride is because God opposes the proud. So naturally, what does that mean? God opposes the proud. How does God oppose the proud? Why would he do that? And I think that the best example of this is found in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11 through 20. And I want you to turn there because this is such an important example of Peter's point. I want us all to see it together. Deuteronomy 8, verse 11. And here Moses says, Deuteronomy 8, 11, take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes which I am commanding you today. Moses said, do not forget Yahweh your God. Why? Because if you do, this might happen. Look at verse 12. Lest, if you forget Yahweh your God, when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, And when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied. Now those things that are described there are all the things that the Lord has promised to do for Israel in the land. To give them houses and fields and flocks and gold and an abundance of wealth the likes of which they would never have known were it not for God. Had God not delivered them from slavery. Had God not led them across the Jordan and had God not fought for them and conquered the land for them. Israel would have never even come near the land were it not for God. They're totally dependent on God for this, but now look at what happens as a result of pride. Look at verse 14. Then your heart be lifted up. Now, a heart that's lifted up, that's Pride, an exalted heart, a heart that elevates, has an elevated view of self, a heart that says, I've got this. That's pride. And look at where pride leads next. Look back to verse 14. When your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. How could they forget the Lord their God? The God who's brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, you would think that if you're a people, your entire nation is enslaved in a land and making bricks with no straw, you would think that you wouldn't forget the God that saved you from that and parted the Red Sea right before your eyes and led you across. You would think that you wouldn't forget a God like that. But how did they do it? The answer is pride. Pride crept in. Pride elevated their hearts. It elevated their view of themselves and it lowered their view of God to the point where they are no longer a people who constantly say, God, I need you. And instead, they've begun to say, I've got this. Look at verse 17. Beware lest you say in your heart, that my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. Do you see what they have done? Now, not only did they allow pride to creep into their heart, not only did their pride cause them to forget about Yahweh their God, but now pride has come full circle to the point that they are claiming God's works as their own. This is what it looks like when the dimmer switch is turned all the way to pride. And we might follow suit. We might say, look at how good I am. Look at how good I am at my job or at parenting or at my hobby or whatever else it is that you might value. You might say, 
I'm so skilled in this area because I, I studied or because I went to a good school or because I worked hard to learn and become an expert or you might say any number of things that you have done and Peter says no. Peter says it's because of God. God put you here. God gave you your brain so that you might learn things. God made you a Christian. You wouldn't have been one without him. You owe everything that you have and are and ever will be to God. Do not become exalted in heart and forget that it was the Lord your God who's done this for you. And certainly, do not begin to claim God's works as your own. That's pride. And look what will happen if you do. Look at verse 19. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. If you forget God and if you go after other gods, be they the Baals or money or sex or whatever it is that you might replace God with, then look at the end of verse 19. You shall surely perish. Do you know what that sounds like to me? That sounds like God opposing the proud. And Peter says, this is why you don't want to be prideful. And you must, you must clothe yourselves with humility. It is because God opposes the proud and he will destroy you. It should be plain after reading Deuteronomy 8 why it is that God opposes the proud. It's because the proud and God, they're competing for the same glory. Pride inclines us to forget what God has done for us, and when we forget what God has done for us, we begin to start taking credit for those things ourselves. And when that happens, the God of the universe opposes you. And I guarantee you that when the creator of heaven and earth opposes you, when he is your opponent, you will never, ever win. You are under his mighty hand whether you live like it or not. Do you see why I said at the beginning that it's impossible to be successful in the Christian life if you have an attitude of pride? That is why the prideful always fall. Their opponent is God. So we must clothe ourselves with humility because God opposes the proud. That's the first reason, but there is a second reason why we should be humble. There's a second reason why we should live this way. And that is, look at the last phrase in verse 5. It says that God also gives grace to the humble. God gives grace to the humble. Now you might say, well, I'm a Christian, so I already have grace. That's what it means to be a Christian, isn't it? We've been given grace. And I want you to notice that, at least in most translations, the, the phrase, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble, is in parentheses. And that's because Peter was quoting from Proverbs 3.34. And there's one other place that Proverbs 3.34, which says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble, there's one other place in the New Testament where that verse is quoted. And that is in James chapter 4 and verse 6. And when James quotes this same phrase, he prefaces it with a little phrase that Peter doesn't add. James says he gives more grace for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. There's more grace. God is not finished dishing out grace. He's finished securing grace on the cross, but we don't have it all, not yet. We're talking about future grace here, like the grace of the crown of glory that will be given to the faithful elders when the good shepherd appears in verse four. Peter says in chapter four and verse 10, he's talking about spiritual gifts and he calls them God's varied graces. God's varied graces, those are Peter's words. And the reality is, if you are humble and you use your gifts that God has given you in a way that exalts God, then God has in turn motivation to give you more gifts, more grace. 
But if you're prideful, and if you forget God, and if you use your gifts in a way that magnifies yourself, then God has motivation to take those gifts away. You see, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Look what happened to Israel. God gave them gifts. They, their heart rose up in pride, and he took those gifts away. He gave them a land, and he banished it from them when they turned against him. If you don't want to miss out on any of the grace that God has in store, then you must not be prideful. God gives different graces to different people, and ultimately, there is a coming future grace that looks like exaltation, which leads us to the next point. What is the motivation to live humbly? And the answer to that question, what is the motivation to live humbly, is found in verse six. Look with me. Verse six says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. There he's just restating the command that we've already talked about to be humble, and he's telling us what humility looks like. It looks like under the mighty hand of God. And then he tells us the motivation. Why should we live humbly? What should motivate us to do that? It is so that at the proper time he may exalt you. There it is. Why should we live humbly? Because of exaltation. We pursue humility now because we want the exaltation to come to pass. The motivation for humble living is that exaltation is coming. Humility has never been a virtue in secular society because they don't have that kind of hope. Peter's calling us to live like people who have hope that even death cannot take away. And Peter's audience, they were facing persecution as a daily reality because of being a Christian. And Peter tells them, you maintain an attitude of humility even through such immensely difficult circumstances because your hope lies in future grace and exaltation, not in the things of this life. The grace that will be poured out on this future day will bring about a great reversal whereby those who have much will have little and those who have little will have much and those who are humble, they will be exalted. Your day is coming. You need not try to get your exaltation now. We will one day be exalted alongside the king who was found in human form and he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, and therefore, God has highly exalted Jesus and has bestowed on him the name that is above every other name that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Do you see what exaltation looks like? And we're gonna be there for that. And not only will we see our humble servant Jesus exalted and confessed as Lord by God and all of creation, but we will be exalted too. And you have to ask, well, well what, what does our exaltation look like? I see what it looks like for Jesus, but what does it look like for me? What does this mean for me? How is this supposed to motivate me to live humbly now? And the answer to that question reveals something extraordinary about our Messiah, Jesus. Jesus is exalted to the highest place in the universe seated at the right hand of God in heaven where he rules as king. But here is where he's different from any other king that ever has been. Our eternal king, Jesus, he doesn't want you to merely be his subjects. Well, sure, he wants you to be subject to his laws and obedient to his commands. But Jesus has purposed to do what no other king in the universe Ever has done. Jesus is going to have his subjects reigning with him. He wants you to be a kingdom of priests. Revelation 20 says that during the millennial reign of Christ, we will be reigning with him. What other king do you know who would ever say anything like that? Paul says it this way in Ephesians 2, verses 5 through 7. He says, 
Even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've, sa you've been saved. But not only does Paul say that God's grace has saved us, he's also exalted us. In Ephesians 2, 7, the very next phrase says, by grace you've been saved, and he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ. That's what it means that you will be exalted. You'll be seated with Christ in heaven with the immeasurable riches of God's grace and kindness lavished on you for all of eternity. We will not merely be his eternal subjects. We will be eternally exalted, eternally lavished with kindness, and eternally loved. And that, that's what can motivate us to live humbly now. That great exaltation is coming. Suffering will be no more. Sin will be no more. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, just a few verses down from our passage, says, The God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And so Peter, Peter's point in saying, humble yourselves so that you might be exalted is this. There is nothing that can be gained by pride in this life that will even compare to the glories of the exaltation and the grace to come. If you get it backwards, you lose. There's nothing that you can gain here by being prideful that's even going to come close to comparing to that. Those who seek pride now get humbled later, but God gives grace to the humble and exaltation is coming. So be humble. And of course, this begs the question, how? How do I do that? How do I live humbly? Sure, you might be convinced that, okay, I don't want to be living in a way that puts me in opposition with God, and I don't want to miss out on any of the grace and exaltation that's coming, but pride comes so naturally. How do you live humbly? And conveniently, Peter tells us exactly how to live humbly, which is the point of verse seven and leads us to our next point, the way to humility. How do we live humbly? And to see this, I want you to look carefully at the very first word in verse seven. It is the word casting. And what I want you to notice about the word casting is that while it's the first word in verse seven, it's not the first word in this sentence. The first word in the sentence is actually at the beginning of verse six, and that is the command to humble yourselves. And so we can read this sentence, humble yourselves by casting. The word casting in verse seven is really seeking to modify the main verb, humble yourself. So how do you humble yourself? You do it by casting. The way to humility is by casting your anxieties on him. Now I think that the word anxieties here has the potential to mislead us. And that's because in modern English language, we tend to associate the word anxiety with a particular psychological disorder that includes panic attacks and such things. But I think that narrows the scope of Peter's word too much. I think Peter's word includes those sorts of things that cause these physiological or psychological reactions. But I think that it's better to think of these anxieties as simply cares or concerns. They might cause panic attacks or they might not. They might just be things that you deeply care about or that are particularly concerning to you. Thus, we're not merely to cast upon God the things that cause apprehension and panic attacks, but we're to cast upon him all the things that we care about. Notice how this fits perfectly 
with the attitude of humility that says, God, I need you. The person who casts says, I've got these concerns and I can't handle them. I can't make them work, but God, I know your power and the might of your hand, and I know that you have the answer to my problem. I trust it into your hands. Lord, help me. This act of casting fits perfectly with the attitude of humility, but it doesn't fit at all with the attitude of pride because the prideful person has lost sight of his dependence on God. The prideful person doesn't cast anything. He doesn't see the need to cast. The prideful person has an over-elevated sense of his own abilities that says, I've got this, rather than God, I need you. And that's the difference between the person who casts and the person who doesn't. If you want to increase humility and squash pride, it comes by an attitude that says, God, I need you in every situation and all of the time. In fact, that's probably the first concern that we should cast upon God. God, help me to see my need for you. Help me to see just how dependent on you I really am. Take away this pride. Cast your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Now you might say, well that's well and good. Cast your anxieties on God and you'll be humble instead of prideful. But how do you actually go about doing that? Is this some abstract thing that Peter's talking about where we're to imagine all of our concerns hurtling towards God like a fishing lure into a lake? No, this is not an arbitrary thing, this casting of anxieties. It's a real casting and a real caring that's really humbling. So how do you do the casting? You do it by prayer. When I say that humility is an attitude that says something, it says, God, I need you, I really do mean that the humble person actually does say those words to God in prayer. When we face a problem in life, our inclination should not be, how can I fix this? That's pride. Our inclination should be to pray, first and foremost to pray, God, I need your help. God, show me the way. Help me to conquer sin. Help me to act patiently towards my children. Help me to be loving toward my wife. Help me to have discipline at my job. Help me to trust you through this cancer. Help me to understand this passage. God, I need you. Once, my wife and I were trying to wrestle through some difficult decisions and I told her that the best way to, to solve a situation like this is to uh, just weigh everything out, the pros and the cons, see what's most logical and do what makes the most sense. And do you see how wrong that was? Do you see how confident I was in my own ability to figure things out and to solve that problem? That was pride. That's an attitude that says, I've got this. That's an attitude that says, I've got to solve this problem. I've got to figure this out. That's an example of an over-elevated dependence on my own intellect and an under-elevated view to my dependence on God. My first instinct should have been, we've got to pray. We've got to ask God, God, help me. In fact, with that attitude of pride, I forgot the Lord my God. Don't make the same mistake. That's what happens when we become exalted in heart. We don't need this exalted attitude that puts the emphasis on our own intellect or our own ability to figure things out and to solve problems. We need God. When you're faced with a difficult decision, you need God. When you don't know how to handle a difficult person at work, you need Him. When your children seem to be choosing the wrong path, you need God. When your transmission fails in your vehicle and you don't have the money to fix it and you don't know how you're gonna to get to work, you need God. Maybe someone in here is struggling with sin. Maybe you're struggling with pornography. Maybe you've been struggling for years 
And maybe you've come to the point where you think, I, I can't. I, I can't stop this. And maybe that's exactly the point. You can't. Maybe your trying needs to include more casting. Or maybe you lost your job and you, you don't know where you're going to pay the rent, how you're going to do that, how you're going to buy the groceries, how you're going to feed your family. God knows how your needs are going to be met. You need Him. You need to cast. Or maybe you went to the doctor as a dear friend of mine did in the past week and got bad news. Maybe you have a terminal illness. Maybe the doctor has only given you a few months to live. Your health is in God's hands and you need Him more than you need the doctor. You need a doctor, but you also need the one who holds the doctor. You need to cast. The point is, when we think that we can handle the problems in our lives on our own, we're guilty of an attitude that, of pride that says, I've got this, and that attitude will fail us every time. But we can cast. We can bring our concerns, our problems, our worries before Him. And He hears them because He cares for you. And this brings us to our final point, the care of God for the humble. Look carefully at the end of verse 7. Casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. The God of this universe cares for you. Not only is God willing to hear our concerns, He wants to. He cares about them. And God's care is an expression of His love. The picture that we should have of God is not a God who's disinterested in hearing our concerns. We're not troubling Him by casting our concerns on Him. The image we should have when we read the words, He cares for you, is that of a loving Father with outstretched arms beckoning us to come, beckoning us to cast because He wants us to, because He loves us, because He cares about the things that are concerning to us. God wants to hear from His children because He cares for them and because He loves each and every one of you. But if we look at how, how exactly does the God of the universe care about you? Then we will see that the greatest example of God's care and of God's love for his humble children is also the greatest example of humility. Because God's greatest act of love was sending Jesus to die in places of sinners like you and me. And God cares for you so much, he was willing to sacrifice his son to make that kind of a relationship between man and God a possibility. Without the death of Jesus, we wouldn't have any of the benefits that we've seen in Peter's words today. Without the death of Jesus, we wouldn't receive any grace from God. We would only be opposed to God. Without the death of Jesus, we would never experience being exalted by God, but we would only experience being brought low by Him, and ultimately, that means being cast into hell. Without the death of Jesus, we wouldn't have a God who cares and who invites us to come in and cast our problems on Him. Rather, we would only go before God to receive judgment for our sins. All of the benefits of the love of God would be null and void were it not for the cross. And that's why we need Him. We can't do it on our own. And in order for the cross to happen, Jesus had to be brought low. Jesus had to humble Himself from His eternal existence in the form of God. And He had to become a humble servant that would suffer and die for you. What greater example of humility could there be? And if if you truly believe that Jesus has done that, if you truly understand what happened at the cross, if you truly understand that you deserved nothing more than eternal opposition from God, 
And now you get to go to heaven and that cost Jesus his life and you get to be exalted along with him forever and all eternity. If you really understand that, I just don't see how you could be comfortable maintaining an attitude of pride. How can your heart be exalted in pride when you realize that the only reason you have anything is because Jesus gave everything? And so, we've seen the greatest example of humility, Jesus laying down his life for you. What then would be the greatest example of pride? And the greatest example of pride is the person who says, I don't need him. If someone should say, well, I, I'm not really a bad person. I, I try to do good things. I, you know, I might make a mistake every once in a while, but certainly God wouldn't send me to hell for that. If that's you, then that is the very attitude of pride that will put you in eternal opposition with God. That's the attitude that says, I don't need you and I don't need your cross. Oh, how I pray that none of us here would live another day in that kind of opposition with God. I pray that all of us would recognize our total dependence on Him. That all of us would humble ourselves by casting all of our worries on Him. All of our anxieties, all of our problems, all of our concerns on him saying, God, I need you in every situation all the time. That should be the refrain. God, I need you. The God of this universe is not opposed to the humble. He listens and he cares. So cast your anxieties on him because we desperately need him. Let's pray. Father, we come and we confess that without you, we are nothing. God, we need you. Help us to see that we are totally dependent on you for everything, that we were created by you, that everything we have is because of you. And most importantly, that without your care for us on the cross, we would be eternally condemned. That's the best we could do on our own. Father, we don't have this. We need you. I pray that you would make us into a people who recognize just how dependent on you we really are. It's in your precious and holy name I pray. Amen.